Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon on what can Congress do to build better buildings. For those of you who may not know, EESI uh, is a nonprofit organization that was formed back in the mid-1980s by a bipartisan group of members of Congress, a bipartisan congressional caucus, in fact, that was very concerned about finding additional resources to try and better inform the congressional debate over issues of science, technology, and policy uh, to make sure that there was timely, factual uh, information that was getting to policymakers since they were always strapped for resources. So that has been our mission for these 35 years, and we continue to do that. This briefing is yet one more example of how we really try to assist policymakers and their staffs in highlighting issues that we think are really important for them to know more about, to provide the voices of people who are specialists, who are experts on these topics, and who really care about finding win-win, very workable policy solutions to problems that are facing us across the country. And so this afternoon, we are taking a look at this issue around buildings, and we are very pleased to have been working with ASHRAE, the International Code Council, as well as the International Association of Lighting Designers, because all of these things are extremely important as we think about our built environment. And one of the things that I think that we so often forget or need to remind ourselves about how much time we really spend indoors and that therefore that environment in, this, in buildings, in the built environment, is critically important in terms of, yes, energy, something that at EESI we're very, very concerned about. Uh, very con and it also very much matters in terms of thinking about productivity, what this means for uh, our ability to function well, to work well, uh, to learn well. Uh, and it really does have an impact upon our health. So there are so many ways in which what happens inside buildings where we spend more than 90% of our time, it's really important that we try and get it right. And it also makes it very important for us to think about not only do we make it more pleasant, more conducive for better health, better environment, uh, better on the efficiency side, but so that we also have our buildings be as resilient as possible since we are dealing with enormous investments in our built environment. And certainly as we look at more and more uh, extreme weather events that occur, it makes it very, very important that we make our buildings as resilient as possible in every sense of the word. So, this afternoon, we are going to hear from three people who have been spending their, their careers looking at these really important issues around our built environment, around our buildings, and also helping us to think about what is the policy role? Does the federal government, does Congress have a role? What should that role be? And certainly, we feel that it is really important to hear from people who are really studying, have been investigating these issues for years to bring all of that expertise to bear. So we are really, really privileged this afternoon to hear from this panel of speakers. We're going to start off hearing from uh, William Fisk, who is, he also goes by Bill, um, who is a senior scientist and mechanical engineer. Uh, leading the uh, Indoor Environment Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He has done research in the whole area of indoor environment uh, for almost 40 years, where he's focused on how indoor environmental conditions affect our health performance and what are some of the methods how we can improve our indoor environments. He's a member of the Academy of Indoor Air Sciences, a fellow of ASHRAE, and he has also served on committees for the Institute of Medicine at the National Academies of Science. OK, 
Okay. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, as Carol indicated, I'm a scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, but I'm speaking to you today at the request of ASHRAE. So I'd start out with just a few words about ASHRAE. ASHRAE is the society, about 50,000, 7,000 professionals, the people who design, build, install, and maintain heating, ventilating, air conditioning, or refrigeration systems for buildings. These are the systems that keep us comfortable in our buildings. And ASHRAE plays a sort of a key educational role, and it's sort of a glue that keeps this community working together. Um, it provides a forum where competitors in business can sit together, often with people like me at the table as well, and develop consensus standards and guidelines and conference programs and position papers that reflect these consensus views and that improve the professional practice. Um, and ASHRAE has many widely used standards. Um, a couple of very widely used standards are standard 62, which specifies minimum ventilation rates and procedures for maintaining acceptable indoor air quality in buildings, and standard 90 for, a building, for maintaining building energy efficiency. So ASHRAE asked me to speak about the influence of the indoor environment on health and productivity. So what I mean about term indoor environment. Well, the indoor environment are the environmental conditions in buildings, the temperature, the humidity, the concentrations of pollutants in the air and on surfaces, um, that, that the uh, lighting conditions and the acoustic conditions, all those together interact and affect the quality of the indoor environment. The, uh, not unexpectedly, the outdoor environment has a strong influence on the indoor environment, the outdoor temperature and humidity and the air pollutant levels. Um, but because we spend, as Carol said, 90% of our time indoors, for many outdoor air pollutants, most of our exposure occurs not when we're outdoors, but when we're indoors. And the features of our buildings can have a pretty profound impact and how much we're sheltered from those outdoor pollutants. So the features of our buildings affect strongly, in some cases, the risks from outdoor air pollution. But that's not the whole story. There are many sources of pollutants in buildings, the building materials, in furnishings, some consumer products, cooking, tobacco smoking, pests of various types, pets, dampness and mold, those are sources of indoor pollutants in buildings. And because we have these indoor sources for many pollutants, the levels of, the concentrations of those pollutants indoors far exceed the concentrations outdoors. So is this important? Well, research from around the world, including in my group, have shown that the indoor environment does affect people's health and productivity. Um, I'll go through some examples. As of 2014, about a quarter of the American population and 14 million children were, were still exposed to secondhand tobacco smoke. And that tobacco smoke is linked to a host of outcomes, um, ear and respiratory infections, increased asthma, lung cancer, heart disease, among other health effects. Um, the uh, concentrations of radioactive radon gas are often many times higher, or almost always many times higher indoors than outdoors. And radon is projected to cause about 15,000 to 22,000 lung cancer cases per year in the United States. And so that's second only to tobacco smoking, direct tobacco smoking as a source of lung cancer. Um, indoors, we have allergens and chemicals from indoor sources that contribute to allergy and asthma symptoms. And in the US, about 8.3% of the population, that's 27 million people, have currently active asthma. Pretty big number, and a larger number are allergic 
and many of them respond to these pollutants to which were exposed indoors, many of which come from indoor sources. Some more examples, dampness and mold are common in our buildings. And where we have dampness and mold in our buildings, we have increases in at, at respiratory, adverse respiratory health effects like cough, and wheeze, and increased asthma. And it's been estimated that about 21% of current active asthma in the United States is due to dampness and mold just in our homes. In 2004, that was estimated to have health costs of about $3.4 billion. It would be more today. We also have dozens of organic chemicals indoors that come from all the products that we use in buildings and use to build our buildings. Some of these um, are irritants. Some increase the risk of cancer. Some of them are suspected to increase asthma or the symptoms of asthma. Many may be harmless, but most, for most of them, we really don't know. So we introduce these chemicals in our buildings, and we don't really know what risks they pose. Okay, so it's not just health, though, that's affected by the indoor environment. It's our performance. And the research has shown that our performance of office work and school work improves when we provide better indoor environmental quality. For example, when we maintain more comfortable temperatures indoors, or when we provide more outdoor air. And here I'd say schools really need particular attention. The data, although limited, suggests that on average, in elementary schools in the United States, those schools provide about half of the amount of outdoor air ventilation that's specified as the minimum requirement in codes. So many schools even fall far short of half and lower ventilation rate in schools are associated with increased student absence and decreased student performance, and including decreased performance on standard academic achievement tests, the tests we use to assess how well our students are doing. So our students in poorly ventilated schools are at a disadvantage. A building energy efficiency, critically important, is linked to indoor environmental quality. Available evidence indicates that in general, when we have an energy efficient building, we make it more comfortable at the same time, thermally comfortable. However, the, in research, energy efficiency's relationship to indoor air pollutant levels and health outcomes has varied. Sometimes it's been positive and sometimes it's been negative. So it really depends on how we implement that energy efficiency as to how it affects our exposures to pollutants and health. The, uh, but I, I really think that if we do this right, if we pay proper attention to limiting sources of pollutants in buildings and assuring adequate ventilation, energy efficiency can be a net gain. It can improve our indoor environment, our comfort, our health, all at the same time. So I think there's a real opportunity there. And I think more broadly that I think of the indoor environmental situation we have today as an opportunity an opportunity to improve health and performance, and it's an opportunity for big financial benefits associated with health and performance improvements. For example, um, one of our analyses projects annual economic benefits of about $20 billion per year just from increasing ventilation rates and reducing high temperatures and reducing dampness and mold in the U.S. office building stock. Another opportunity indicates the opportunity to reduce premature mortality by doing a better job of particle filtration in our homes with annual health-related economic benefits to the occupants of 100 to sometimes more than 1,000, a few hundred to more than $1,000 per person. And with those health-related economic benefits, eating costs, often by a factor of 10. It's even more extreme opportunity examples. In office buildings, better particle filtration looks even more cost effective, where the health-related economic benefits of better filtration are projected to exceed costs by a factor of 70 to 120. 
In schools, you have an opportunity to, to ventilate better, make them more comfortable, and improve, reduce the absence, and improve the performance of our students. Well, there's certainly a lot of uncertainty with the precise numbers associated with those economic benefits. But I think there's no doubt that there's a really large opportunity nationwide to improve our health and our performance and to gain financially if we do a better job within our environments in our buildings. So I want to close with a few comments about the federal connection. All federal agencies have workers in buildings. Consequently, all should have an interest in maintaining good indoor environmental quality in those buildings to assure worker comfort and health and productivity. But many federal agencies actually have other mission-related reasons to be concerned about the indoor environment. And I'll give you not all the examples, but a few. Um, the Department of Energy, the EPA, NIOSH, NIH, for example, have related research programs, albeit often quite modest ones. Department of Energy promotes building energy efficiency, and as I indicated, that can influence indoor environmental quality positively or negatively. EPA has an environmental protection mission, and EPA has programs to educate stakeholders about indoor environmental quality, and it helps develop protocols for stakeholders such as schools so that they can cost effectively and effectively manage indoor environmental quality in schools. HUD has responsibilities for housing, including subsidized housing. Department of Education seeks to maximize the effectiveness of our education system. And to do that, we need to maintain good in indoor environmental conditions at our buildings. The General Services Administration is responsible for federally owned and leased building spaces. FEMA, for example, supplies temporary housing for people after disasters. So all these agencies have a reason to be interested in the indoor environment. And I think with sufficient resources and attention to indoor environmental quality, each of these agencies can help us maintain comfortable, healthy, and productive productivity enhancing conditions in U.S. buildings. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And once again, it was a kind of a, a very good illustration of how so many different places, so many different agencies all play a role. So it's not just one, one agency, one person's responsibility, but as we look at how the built environment, how buildings affect us in so many different ways that everybody needs to kind of play their part in terms of everybody has a piece in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of thinking about committees, I guess I would say on the Hill, as well as then the agencies that they oversee. So to take uh, an additional look at, at buildings and what this means, our second speaker is going to talk about the whole role of lighting. And so we will hear from Randy Burkett, who is the president and design principal of Randy Burkett Lighting Design, Inc. And he is also an active member of the International Association of Lighting Designers and is a former uh, past president of that organization. Of course, they uh, are one of the sponsoring organizations today. As principal of, uh, of his firm, he establishes design direction and oversees the management of the firm's projects. And he has involved in several technical committees, um, uh, technical and design committees, including quality of the visual environment, lighting for outdoor public spaces, as well as the color metric task group. Now, I don't know what some of those things are, but I am eager to, but I am always eager to learn. So, Randy has designed for a whole variety of different kinds of projects. Um, very, very diverse collection of of environments, including everything from convention centers to healthcare facilities and laboratories to museums to retail malls and stores to corporate offices to signature bridges. And of course, I always love 
signature bridges that are so beautiful when, when you see them. And, and as well as building exteriors and site developments. So we are eager to hear from Randy. Thank you, Carol. Who wrote that? Uh, it's good to be on this panel with colleagues who care just as passionately as I do about the subject of the built environment. I do want to thank the International Association of Lighting Designers for inviting me to uh, speak as a lighting design professional here to you all. And as you might surmise, I'm going to talk about lighting. I'll try not to get into the real nerdy stuff that Carol referenced, but I want to be very specific, though, about what we're really talking about today that's important. Often we take lighting for granted. Maybe I don't, but I'd say uh, most people do, and frankly, they should, because that's not the, normally the nature of, and the uh, focus of their lives. Lighting reinforces our lives and what it is we do, whether it's performing a task. Those of you who might be reading your notes right now or perhaps seeing me, uh, there's a technical task involved. You're trying to see my facial expressions. You're trying to take notes on a pad. You need light to accomplish that, at least effectively. And that's probably where it ends for a lot of people. Do I have enough light to see? And that is very, very important. But it goes far further, or far uh, deeper than that. The slide uh, that you see up on the screen right now is one that uh, seeks to sort of pick apart the nature of what good lighting is. And I'm gonna use a term that we use a lot as, a, as design professionals, lighting quality. By that, we mean that it's more than just the numbers, more than how much light. It's also what kind of light are we, how do we design with the light, and what kind of lighting environment are we creating? Uh, you can see on the screen a, a, a Venn diagrams that sort of have at their center the term lighting quality. I wish lighting quality was a recipe. I wish I could say I need three foot candles here on this podium, and I have good lighting quality. It's far more involved and perhaps sometimes more complex than that. I think oftentimes, uh, I've heard one of my colleagues say, I know good lighting only when I really see it. And that's probably true. And maybe you don't know when you're seeing it. And that's OK, too. But you'll notice the, 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 the types of uh, words that you see in these diagrams, the kinds of things that we feel contribute to a quality lighting environment. Uh, one of the things that we've all, I think, in our lives uh, experienced is being able to, or going somewhere where lighting actually is distracting. And we say, ah, I can't see that. Or, and what you're typically uh, seeing is glare. It's, uh, it's hurting you uh, in a sense that you, it is uh, not allowing you to see a speaker, in my case, or a play at a theater, or perhaps driving down the road at night. Why is it more difficult to see at night? There are, other, there are a lot of visual things going on. As lighting professionals, we try to control that the best we can. But let's suffice it to say from this slide that lighting quality is a real, um, a real soup of, of uh, metrics and uh, decisions that are made about quality and in the environment, architecture, uh, location. Uh, all of that goes into a good lighting design and ultimately to a successful project and a successful building. And these, uh, you saw from the previous slide, uh, the top half of the slide had a, full, a few bullet points about quality. And this one talking about satisfaction and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and productivity in the work environment. If you hate going to work, I hope it's not the lighting, but it could be contributing to that. Uh, in fact, there have been some studies in the past that have shown that lighting is connected specifically to productivity. Sometimes uh, that can be seen in uh, more controlled environments like factories and where widgets are being produced. But it's sa the same is true of almost any working environment. Productivity is affected by the lighted environment. And part of that is how much light, but a lot of it is what kind of light is designed for the space. <clears throat> We think we can use light, we know we can use light to elevate performance. Uh, certainly, if you were to sit in the moonlight in an open field and try to read War and Peace, 
The eye is robust and res uh, enough that it would allow you to, s to begin to read War and Peace. But my guess is after a few minutes, you're going to say, I need more light to read War and Peace. You, you actually wanted to be more efficient at reading it, and more, you're, you want your eye to be able to see that. So that's important, and that's a, factual, a fact about visual performance. But it goes beyond that. We can create environments that increase import in uh, performance uh, while maintaining a light level reasonable for your task. Enhancing mood is something that we feel we do a lot as lighting designers. Um, we feel that uh, the setting for a worker or for someone who goes out for a nice restaurant or for a nice meal at a restaurant, uh, enhancing that uh, through lighting makes and heightens the experience. Bill was talking about schools and uh, we've, we know that lighting can help uh, keep um, alertness in students. There's a lot we don't know about it, but we do know that lighting affects that. So when students come in first thing in the morning, maybe they need to be, uh, their alertness needs to be enhanced. But part of the, the environment too is about, literally about the desirability of space. I mentioned the restaurant. Uh, you certainly don't want to go to a restaurant with poor lighting and, and think that, oh goodness, this isn't what I expected. Oftentimes, lighting dictates the feeling of the room. We feel well-being is somewhat hard to define. Uh, I looked it up on Wikipedia, like everything else in life, and well-being is defined as the state of being comfortable, healthy, and happy. Hopefully you're all that today, but like all the other environmental aspects of a building, lighting contributes to that. I'm going to give you a, an example in just a moment. Finally, a psychological reinforcement. Uh, I went to university many years ago, but I had a mentor there, John Flynn, who was a professor at Penn State, and he instilled in me the, the, the basic tenets of the impact of light on quality through how it psychologically reinforces space. And sometimes that's negative reinforcement. If you've ever been to a space where you just feel uncomfortable, you don't know why, lighting might have contributed to that. Or an uncomfortable space that, you know, I just you know, fallen asleep in here. Lighting may have played a role in that. We now know enough that we can think about this in design. And of course, it goes for the outdoors. We're talking about the built environment today primarily, but let's, let us not forget that there's a lot of outdoor environment where people gather and socialize. In fact, there's an urban renaissance in many of our American cities and in the rest of the world for that matter. I think it's important that we pay attention to that as well. And some of the same things apply. In this case, in our urban environments, to make it safe and secure, you constantly hear the drum beat about how much light, I need more light, I need this. And that can and may be true, but we also need other things. How do you reinforce aspects of orientation and wayfinding? How do you make, make people perceive a safe environment? If you're walking toward me in a, on a, uh, in a park, do I need to see your facial expressions to determine weigh me what, whether or not I should uh, take action? These are all things that we can now take into account as lighting professionals. And of course, not only the, the parks and, and public areas themselves, but the buildings around us. We've just finished a major master plan for the city of San Antonio. And we were able to demonstrate to the decision makers that in the visual environment, your pathway occupies only about 10 or 12% of your visual field. To not care about that other 80 to 90% would be foolhardy. We have to, to the degree we can, help dictate how that lighting is perceived. Now, for the past, um, well, since 2005, uh, so for the past 14, maybe 15 years, the Department of Energy has had a program uh, initiated by EPACT uh, in 2005 to uh, the Energy Policy Act to foster the development of the next generation of lighting. And by that, they were specifically talking about solid state or LEDs, as many of you, I'm sure, call them which they are, but uh, solid state is the, perhaps the more inclusive term. And they have done a darn good job, I think, technically. A lot of wonderful research has been done in, the, uh, in manufacturing, both manufacturing and fundamental research of LEDs. They have brought them to the forefront of what we do. They are our new tools in our box. 95% of what we specify today as practitioners is an LED, involves an LED source. It's by Going through this program, we have brought, brought, have brought the source to a high level of efficiency and use uh, 
uh, well, much faster had it not been done that way. <clears throat> you can go on the website and see what's been done. I'm not going to dwell on these bullet points, but a great deal of research and development of LEDs. And um, here's some wonderful, interesting, I'll just read one. Um, well, environmentally robust quantum dot down converters for highly efficient solid state lighting. I've got copies of that here. So it's, it's a highly technical field. However, there have been some, albeit I feel not that many, uh, exploratory uh, programs done through the Gateway uh, program uh, through the DOE that tests some of the equipment in the field. And that has been reasonably successful, but we've barely scratched the surface of that potential. As design professionals, in, in my case in lighting and certainly some of my colleagues in other fields, we would like to see more hands-on uh, research work in the field, post-occupancy evaluation, doing work in uh, buildings where we can examine lighting and all its effects, not just how much light I need. $450 million have been invested through the solid state lighting program of the DOE since 2005. Much of it very well spent on the development of solid state lighting. I think that we would all benefit collectively, just not our professions, but uh, at large, the public and uh, others, to invest more in the outcome of using these new tools. So um, again, major lighting influences you see on the screen here, uh, glare, circadian influences, visual comfort, many of the things Bill actually mentioned about how air and uh, air quality can have a bearing on your well-being in space, in a space. The same can be said but in a different way for lighting. We feel this is very important. And there's a lot of opportunity for research in this area, both indoor and out. I think what I want to do as I close my discussion is to talk about where, this need, where and why this needs to take place. We can continue to develop and fine tune solid state lighting as an instrument, as a lighting source, and I think we should. There's been some wonderful fruit out of that uh, program. But I think it's time, uh, collectively, I think the federal government and other entities have an opportunity now to take this wonderful new tool and see that it's applied properly in the build environment. Now, that might, you might say, well, that's your job, Randy. Well, yeah, okay, to a certain degree it is. But the success of LEDs and its, its introduction to the marketplace from profession, to professionals like me down to someone who goes to the local hardware store and plucks out a bulb off the shelf, everyone will benefit from an investment in looking at lighting and environments and how it influences aspects of our environment that focus on well-being, perceptions of safety, security, all of these things. There's much known about it, but I think we can do a lot more development work in our research that can be then used by practitioners, not only like myself, but hopefully the public. Bill mentioned GSA. Um, There's several other departments, uh, Department of Defense. Uh, they do a lot of work in understanding glare and making visibility better for their armed forces on the field, especially. These are all things that are being done behind the scenes, but I think a concerted research effort focusing on the value of light in the built environment uh, can really improve all the built, entity, uh, all the built uh, buildings and construction that occurs in our country. Thank you for this time. Thanks, Randy. It's, it's really interesting when you really stop and think about how we are affected, how we are influenced by that kind of lighting in our, in our environment. Um, I'll never forget several years ago meeting with folks as LEDs are being uh, brought onto the market and, and being shown uh, pictures of, and, and then later experiencing the whole situation with regard to parking garages. And you, you mentioned safety, um, an enormous change in 
the quality of light by putting LEDs in parking garages, which totally made the atmosphere with regard to public safety so, so different. And so there are so many different attributes. I um, remember also talking to architects about schools and what this means for learning and teaching environments um, and what it, it can, the difference that it makes in, in schools. And we all know what a difference it makes in terms of how, I think, how we feel, but figuring out what really is going on so that we truly optimize all of these wonderful new developments that have been invested in that are now in the market to really understand how we can truly optimize it, I think is, is a very, very important point. So now to really try and kind of wrap up kind of what what we really need in this built environment to make sure that we truly are linking these things together, thinking about what our buildings should really involve so that we truly are getting the most out of them, that we're optimizing the, the investment in those buildings, how they're going to be used, how they're going to be used for years, how that's going to affect the people living, working, um, uh, playing in those environments, shopping in those environments. We're going to hear now then uh, from Ryan Kolker, who has been working in the buildings sector for a long time. I think that I first met him when he was working at, at ASHRAE um, with, as manager of government affairs, but he also has been a vice president of the National Institute of Building Sciences. And of course, he is currently the vice president of innovation at the International Code Council where he is responsible for identifying emerging issues in the building industry, including how new technologies can best be leveraged by codes and standards and how we make sure to modernize the application of building regulations and the development of strategies that are going to support members and building safety professionals. So to kind of put this all together and why codes are so important, uh, we will hear from, from Ryan. I know I usually think of codes as a tail that wags a very big dog. Thanks, uh, Carol. I definitely appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning, this afternoon, and um, particularly the the linkage comment, which is really you know what we're talking about today. You know, Bill and and Randy certainly talked about very important aspects of the built environment. I'll give you a few more, but the thing that really brings all of that together uh, is building codes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, you know what building codes are. Uh, how they're developed, how they're adopted, uh, and why we really need to have a, a renewed focus on making sure that folks are actually following uh, building codes. So the codes themselves actually cover many of the things uh, that uh, Bill and Randy talked about, you know, whether that's ventilation or radon, uh, the building enclosure, which keeps the outside from the inside, uh, thinking about the materials themselves, uh, mold, mildew, um, filtration, energy efficiency, you know, all of these various different topics are captured at a minimum level within the codes itself. Uh, so as far as, uh, I'll actually go back, the, the model codes are actually developed uh, through a process uh, directed by the International Code Council, where we bring together experts from, uh, you know, across the entire industry, uh, stakeholders representing, you know, all aspects of the industry, the public, uh, federal agencies, researchers, uh, and they're, they're able to provide input to the next edition uh, of the building code. Uh, the codes themselves are adopted uh, and enforced at the state and local level, uh, and then they're also used as the basis for criteria within federal agencies. Uh, so General Services Administration, uh, State Department Overseas Buildings, uh, Department of Defense, HUD, uh, all base their programs to some degree on uh, baseline minimum codes uh, that are developed uh, through the ICC process. In addition to all of the various different uh, topics uh, that Bill and Randy mentioned, we have codes that address almost anything you could possibly imagine you know, relative to the built environment. Uh, so there's an energy efficiency code, uh, there's a wildland urban interface code to address those sorts of issues. Uh, the international building code uh, you know, addresses structural aspects, uh, indoor uh, aspects as well, uh, plumbing codes, 
Uh, so really looking at all of those various different things that we uh, care about relative to health, safety, and welfare uh, in the built environment. So I'm going to touch on a, a couple things that are captured uh, within the code, uh, highly relevant things that we've seen in the news right, lately, uh, and then how the progression through the various different editions of the code actually get us uh, closer to where we should be uh, relative to building safety. Uh, so folks may have been following this story relative to uh, carbon monoxide uh, in public housing uh, and the fact that uh, current HUD regulations actually don't capture uh, the detection requirements uh, to let residents know that they're actually uh, being exposed to carbon monoxide. Uh, so within the 2015 uh, version of the International uh, Fire Code, uh, it actually required installation of carbon monoxide sensors uh, within new construction in most residential buildings. Uh, shifting to the 2018, it actually provided a retroactive requirement uh, within the fire code for application of uh, carbon monoxide sensors in existing buildings. So the, the, the technology, the requirements, the information is captured there uh, in the building code. And so certainly as we see things moving from 2015, uh, to the 2018 edition of the codes, you know, we're providing new technologies, uh, new requirements, and capturing the, the latest uh, information relative to what should be uh, within the codes itself. I think unfortunately, uh, right now, uh, 32 states actually don't require uh, the 2015 level requirements of a carbon monoxide sensor uh, in their codes. And that's really a function of not keeping up to date uh, with the building codes themselves. Another important you know, thing to think about, you know, we talked uh, about schools, uh, certainly uh, in tornado prone areas, having uh, storm shelters incorporated within schools, uh, again, captured within the 2015 uh, edition of the International Building Code, uh, yet only seven states uh, within you know, what we would consider Tornado Alley have those requirements in place. And so thinking about what level of exposure that has uh, for students uh, teachers and you know anyone else visiting uh, those facilities as well. Uh, so again, you know, keeping up to date with codes is really an opportunity to capture uh, those requirements. Uh, a few additional things that have been captured uh, within the latest editions of the building code uh, in 2015: additional storm shelter requirements, uh, as I just talked about, uh, not just for educational facilities but also for. Um, critical facilities as well. Uh, again, you know, if you're not keeping up to date uh, with these code requirements, you're not capturing uh, that benefit. Um, you know, thinking about uh, an interest in growing uh, solar uh, and renewable energy. So, you know, new criteria for uh, how solar panels are attached to buildings and how uh, they influence the structural integrity of those buildings themselves. Um, you know, uh, special inspections for seismic resistance in, in seismic regions is another uh, important element captured within the 2015 uh, IBC. And then moving to the 2018 codes, you know, even further uh, structural improvements based off of new mapping uh, that's provided through federal agencies like uh, the Geological Survey uh, and uh, standard setting organizations like the American Society of Civil Engineers uh, are captured into the latest editions of the codes. And so being able to capture the latest information, the latest research, uh, the latest knowledge uh, is certainly important. We talked about uh, energy efficiency. Uh, so certainly uh, there are some opportunities to advance the resilience discussion uh, through energy codes themselves. Uh, so thinking about the durability of products, uh, the, the ventilation requirements, the filtration requirements, uh, even uh, fire safety of you know, making sure that uh, gaps in buildings are uh, sealed up uh, to prevent fire spread. Um, thinking about you know, mold and mildew and the ab ability to uh, you know, ventilate and keep moisture out of uh, walls and trapping you know, that moisture in. So you know, a whole host of different strategies that are covered uh, by building codes, but really only if we continue to uh, you know, make sure that, that we're up to date and capturing those. So in addition to just kind of the uh, specific aspects of code themselves, uh, there's a body of research around, you know, what are we actually gaining uh, through the, the adoption of, of codes? Uh, so a FEMA study uh, looked at eight states in the southeast uh, and found that $500 million in annualized losses were avoided uh, because of uh, having codes in place. Uh, thinking about windstorm losses uh, since the adoption of the Florida Building Code, uh, which is based off of an ICC code. Uh, those losses have been reduced by 72% because they had a code in place. 
uh, hail damage uh, in Missouri, uh, a, a uh, you know, 15 to, to 30 percent uh, reduction in losses because the code uh, was in place. And so all of these various different things you know, really provide a, a, a snapshot as to why uh, codes are important. So, you know, I, I just kind of laid out, you know, why we should be thinking about uh, the adoption of codes. Um, but so, so why are we having this conversation today if codes provide, you know, all of these valuable things? Uh, so as I mentioned on the outset, uh, codes and standards are typically adopted uh, at a state and local level. Uh, so this is a map uh, that FEMA put together of where uh, modern building codes uh, are in place. And you see uh, there are some places that actually are not up to date uh, on their building codes. Uh, so how do we think about uh, encouraging uh, these communities uh, to make sure that they're capturing all of those benefits uh, that I talked about? Additionally, uh, as, as Carol mentioned, uh, I was recently at the National Institute of Building Sciences, which many of you be, may be familiar with, uh, the uh, mitigation save study uh, that's been conducted on the value of uh, disaster and hazard mitigation investments, uh, the four to one number, which folks uh, you know, have probably widely cited. Uh, so they've actually gone through the effort to update and expand that study, looking at a variety of different mitigation mechanisms. And so one of the things that they looked at was actually a, the adoption of uh, an up-to-date building code. Uh, and so uh, they found that the um, $1 invested uh, in adoption of a 2018 building code uh, resulted in $11 of benefit uh, to the community. Uh, and that, that benefit accrues from the continual adoption uh, of building codes. And as you can see, you know, it's across various different uh, hazards, um, but certainly you know, the benefit at a national level of $1 uh, invested for $11 of benefit is, is certainly critical. And then looking across all the various different things that, that feed into that number. Uh, so property loss is certainly a key piece of that. Uh, business interruption, um, you know, injuries, death, you know, all of these things are uh, part of you know, what you get when you adopt uh, an up-to-date building code. Uh, and then certainly thinking kind of the, um, uh, you know, adoption is, is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and you can't have an effective code system without the adoption itself. Uh, but the second piece is actually enforcement, uh, making sure that you know, people are on the ground uh, providing education, uh, you know, providing uh, enforcement and inspections to make sure that these things are actually implemented. Uh, and, and so that's certainly another uh, key area you know, where um, you know, activity within the building code space uh, is important. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, federal agencies have certainly picked up uh, the benefits of uh, building codes themselves. Uh, so, you know, FEMA has uh, established building codes as one of the key aspects uh, and key objectives of their strategic plan. Uh, the uh, Community Development Block Grant uh, disaster recovery uh, piece has uh, building codes as a cornerstone. Uh, certainly GSA and DOD uh, are implementing uh, codes within their practices. Uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission as well. Uh, and then certainly on a congressional level, you know, I certainly commend uh, Congress for their recent activities around recognizing the benefits that codes have uh, through the Dis Disaster Recovery Reform Act, the Bipartisan Budget Act, uh, but there's certainly uh, many opportunities uh, to continue that effort and many outlets to make sure that uh, communities are capturing uh, the benefits that are provided by building codes. You know, one key aspect as part of the ongoing uh, discussion around infrastructure investments um, you know, any federal dollar that goes towards uh, any sort of infrastructure uh, should be built to the minimum requirements of the latest code. Uh, in many, uh, in, in, you know, many agencies, they actually defer to uh, the state or local requirements uh, as to the basis of what the, the codes are. Uh, and I showed you the map earlier of where modern uh, building codes are in place. So in some places, you know, those code requirements are, are incre incredibly uh, old uh, or, or not in place at all. And so, you know, any federal dollar uh, that we're investing in uh, schools, in uh, hospitals, in community centers uh, should all be tied towards uh, the latest uh, building code uh, criteria. Uh, also, certainly as uh, Congress continues to talk about uh, flood insurance program, uh, again, you know, minimum code requirements uh, tied to the latest edition of the codes uh, will certainly capture a significant benefit. 
you know, the NFIP already captures a little bit of uh, the benefits of codes uh, within the, uh, the uh, community rating system, uh, but certainly there are other opportunities uh, to attach uh, minimum requirements uh, around uh, up-to-date codes. Uh, and then finally, you know, as Bill mentioned, there are many agencies that are involved in, in research and development that support codes, uh, technical assistance that supports codes, uh, and so being able to support those uh, through appropriate uh, appropriations uh, is certainly a key area uh, to continue that discussion moving forward and assure that we are capturing uh, the most up-to-date uh, research and knowledge uh, within the building codes itself. And then finally, on an exciting note, uh, May is Building Safety Month. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly uh, look forward to everybody uh, celebrating Building Safety Month. Uh, ICC is hosting a reception on uh, May 22nd, uh, so certainly, uh, you know, we would love to have you there. Um, but it's really an opportunity to amplify the message that, uh, you know, building safety is an important uh, piece of our nation. Uh, building codes and code officials are important supporters uh, of that effort. Uh, we're uh, getting proclamations from across all levels of government, uh, city, state, local, uh, working with federal agencies as well. Uh, and so really an opportunity to amplify that message, you know, broader than folks in this room, uh, but to the public themselves. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ryan. And one thing um, I wanted to take note of, too, is that you are also the director of the Alliance for National and Community Resilience. So in conjunction with that, I have an opening question, um, which is in terms of thinking about uh, the messages around codes, how it is connected to all of these issues and in terms of public health and safety. So how are these communities that are part of this group, how are, how are they responding to this message and um, and how do we get more communities to do that? Because we also saw that map that you put up there, which means that a lot of them aren't. Right, exactly. Um, so uh, Anchor is actually working on developing benchmarks that communities can really use to understand where they are and where they can be going relative to each other. Uh, and so we're looking at all of the various different functions that uh, communities have. Uh, so buildings is certainly a key piece of that, looking at housing, looking at healthcare, uh, educational facilities, um, you know, transportation networks, all of those various different aspects that make communities work. Uh, and so the first benchmark we actually released was on buildings. Uh, and some of the fundamental uh, requirements or benchmarks you know, within the building's benchmark itself is actually looking at your code system. You know, do you have an up-to-date code? Do you provide uh, education and training to your code officials, to your contractors? Um, you know, thinking about all of those different strategies. And so, you know, the, the communities that have been engaged in, in Anchor have recognized that as a fundamental aspect of, you know, any approach to resilience. Uh, you can't be a resilient community if you don't have an up-to-date building code. Um, you're just, you're not capturing the, the benefits that code provide, uh, and you're not, your building stock is not up to par. Great. Um, Let's, uh, let's open it up for questions and comments. We'll start here. Okay. Yeah, so you, you can go to um, iccsafe.org uh, in the government uh, relations page. Uh, we'll have all that information. Um, in the next couple of weeks, actually, as part of Building Safety Month, we'll be releasing a map that should be uh, incredibly helpful that you can click on and just dive into, you know, what specific uh, codes are in place within your community and provide you resources to, to actually do something about it. So that's how we all can figure out what is happening in our local jurisdiction. That's, that's great. Um, any other comments or questions? Back here, sure. What do you think the barriers are to uh, for states and local communities to adopt So the question is about what are the barriers, okay? Yeah, so, you know, each, each community is certainly um, different, and there are, you know, a variety of different reasons as to, you know, why communities uh, don't adopt uh, the latest codes. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's a state-level decision, and, and local, you know, governments don't have 
uh, the ability to adopt codes unless the state says they can. Uh, and so that creates sort of a, a political process uh, at a state level. Um, some states have a uh, almost an automatic kind of update process that as new editions of the code uh, come out, um, you know, they, they go through a review process, but it's, you know, pretty, pretty streamlined. Um, some cases, you know, it's a very long, drawn out, um, deliberative process, uh, you know, at, with committees uh, at a state level. Um, sometimes it's a legislative action. Uh, and so, you know, there are a variety of different mechanisms. Um, the challenge is, you know, you have stakeholders from uh, numerous different positions uh, that are, you know, like the status quo. Um, but I think one of the uh, important things that came out of the, the National Institute of Building Sciences study was actually looking at all of the various different stakeholders uh, within the design, construction, uh, and occupancy uh, process and found that um, every single stakeholder actually had a net benefit from adopting and enforcing uh, up-to-date building codes. Um, so I think it's a matter of uh, you know, making sure that folks that are uh, concerned about assuring codes are in place uh, are, are engaged at the state and local level uh, to say that it's an important, you know, consumer protection issue, uh, a, 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 you know, a safety issue. Uh, and so, you know, having the public involved uh, to maybe counter, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, folks in opposition to updating codes, uh, I think would certainly be beneficial as well. A follow-up on that. Um, is that, has that been well publicized in terms of, you know, showing how everybody, how every sector, every stake, every, um, uh, you know, uh, stakeholder has a benefit actually that comes out of this? Um, it, I, I wouldn't say it's widely publicized yet. I think um, it but needs to be. I yes, think it certainly needs something to be. that we're working on. Um, there is a, an effort uh, to get consumers, uh, you know, more engaged and interested in uh, codes at a local level. Uh, so the No Codes, No Confidence project is really looking at, uh, you know, assuring consumers have the information. Because uh, basically what that research found is that folks are assuming that their local government is protecting them and that they're up to date on building codes, but don't necessarily have the knowledge that that's actually the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this question could be for anybody that's uh, directed more towards Bill with this. Would you um, say that, that state codes, standards, federal, federal requirements are acknowledged the indoor environmental quality aspects, the toxins, et cetera, that you were speaking to in terms of the, the wellness and the health um, benefits? I think we've all seen the hurricane sort of repeat the question from there? Okay. Um, yeah, the question was, do codes um, reflect or count for sort of the in indoor environmental effects? Um, and I'd say to some extent they do. Um, in many cases, the codes are minimum requirements, and the research shows that going beyond the minimum can provide further benefits. Um, also, the codes sort of tend to lag in time, sort of behind the, the state of knowledge. But the codes are incredibly important. They provide a really important baseline. And they're one of the most you know, effective ways to get change. Um, so I'm a strong supporter of codes and improving codes. Um, but we do also have to make sure those codes are enforced. And I think there's some, and, you know, Ryan mentioned that, there's some big gaps in terms of enforcement. For example, I mentioned schools where it looks like on average we provide half of the amount of outside air ventilation. That's the minimum amount specified in, in codes. So that's an example of where enforcement really doesn't happen. So, Bill, I was rather horrified when you made that comment about 50% um, about of the schools not having adequate ventilation. So what and for any of you, what is the best way to encourage compliance? What all needs to be done? 
And you can all answer that question. <laughs> well, Bill, Bill grabs a drink. Uh, the question is valid for lighting as well. I think historically, and I think you probably agree, Ryan, that most codes will treat lighting as, as simply a number. You need so much light, you can, only, um, you can only use so much energy and so forth, which are important frameworks uh, for a code to establish. And they're ones that are quantifiable, enforceable to a degree. Uh, I think what we look for in codes, we'd like to see more acknowledgement of some of the elements that both Bill and I were talking about earlier, the quality of, sort of the quality of the environment, whether it's visual or uh, aural or uh, Bill's case with airflow and, and toxins. Uh, I think there, the code should be elastic enough to allow professionals to address those issues with their clients beyond uh, what the code minimum might be. And again, it's an important framework, but I think uh, codes could encourage um, going beyond the minimum uh, as part of their language to seek out professionals, for example, when uh, they, they feel that this particular aspect of, a, of uh, their buildings should be addressed. And I, I think that having that sort of elasticity to the, um, the code process would help encourage uh, professionals and, frankly, the end user to ask more questions about, well, I know it's enough, but what else can I do to make the employees in my building happy or the people in my home uh, happier? And uh, I think there's a role for codes in that. I th certainly as a professional, we preach that and we talk to our clients, but I think just making codes um, uh, friendly to those kinds of things is uh, probably one of the best things we can do. Well, and I, th I think there's a, a specific federal opportunity here as well when we talk about schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, billions of dollars in grants are you know provided for school construction, uh, and so you know assuring that uh, you know those buildings are you know built to at least the the minimum requirements, um, but then also you know having a regular process for assuring that uh, you know those those ongoing requirements are actually continuing uh, to be met. Um, potentially as you know, qualification for future grant funding um, certainly could be uh, an opportunity, but also you know, providing technical assistance um, to communities who may not have you know, the resources in-house uh, to be able to, to really um, you know, assure that they're meeting those requirements, I think would be you know, an opportunity as well. Well, and I would bet that there are a lot of communities where people aren't even sure what questions to ask, and that that could be, that whole education part could be really, really important. Uh, let alone in terms of getting the right professionals in to really look at it and to uh, to move that forward. And and I think the schools issue that you raise with regard to codes is is also uh, really important when we are thinking about all of the different kinds of things that are in the air in our buildings and everything. When you've got new materials coming in in terms of equipment, furniture. Um, building materials or whatever that off gas and what that means particularly with there's not adequate ventilation and and also with kids whose bodies are their systems are still in development which creates even greater vulnerability so i would think that there should be several agencies that at the federal level that would be concerned from a health perspective with regard to yeah, and also, in, you know, in many communities, the schools are the shelters for, you know, emergency exactly. events yeah. as well. So there's, they're not just the impacts on, you know, the, the kids that go there every day, but thinking about the broader impacts, you know, to the community sure. as well. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that um, oftentimes we look at codes or people look at codes as, well, I've got to meet the code, I've got to meet the code, and maybe it's um, one water square foot or whatever mm -hmm. from our perspective. And... Uh, the code isn't an end all, it's a framework for engineering and design to take place in the build environment. And I think there's an education process. I think the professional organizations like ASHRAE, the IALD, the IES uh, can educate our colleagues, certainly. But I uh, also feel there's probably ways that uh, we can build, uh, work with our, the, the code teams to build in language to uh, maybe in the user guide version of the, uh, the code book that helps uh, the people recognize when they have to pay even deeper attention to an issue, uh, not just to the code required. Did you want to add anything, Bill? Or Well, 
course, that, that codes um, are incredibly important. <clears throat> they actually affect change very broadly in the population, um, but there tend to be minimum standards, and they're often not actually enforced in practice. So we have a ways to go um, to improve those, but they're just incredibly important, and we need to keep moving forward with codes, pushing adoption of codes, but also letting people understand sort of the health and economic and productivity benefits of better indoor environments and of exceeding code requirements as well. Right, we shouldn't be only about the minimum, but indeed going beyond since, uh, so I, on, on that point, because compliance is such a major issue, I was just curious, what is your experience about code compliance, say, in the EU, or in terms of codes and, and compliance? Any of the same issues, or are they better about it than what we are here in the U.S., or what, can you speak to that at all? Mr. International Code Council, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I guess one thing to, to think about relative to, um, you know, code adoption and enforcement uh, elsewhere, um, the U.S. actually has a unique kind of development process itself. Um, so, you know, codes are developed through the engagement of, uh, you know, the, the private sector, government, um, you know, manufacturers, uh, all coming together under a, a private sector driven process, mm -hmm. uh, which allows then, you know, states and local governments, uh, you know, to adopt those codes uh, and, and, you know, transform them as they see fit within their local environment. Uh, in, in almost every other country, codes are actually developed by the government. Um, and so, you know, there's certainly a, uh, a you know, a tie there to uh, enforcement. Uh, you know, if it's a government product uh, that's enforced, you know, through governmental channels, uh, usually, you know, in a, in a kind of a centralized way, um, you know, it's a very different type of process uh, than we have here. Um, but, you know, it, America's built off, the, you know, the work of the private sector and, and assuring that everyone has a seat at the table. So it's a very different type of process. But the difference in the process does end up with, it sounds like, more difficulty in terms of getting compliance here than what it may perhaps I, I, in the EU? Or am I misunderstanding? I, yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I think okay. you have less... Um, less centralized sure. um, control over enforcement um, here because of the process of development, um, but also, you know, uh, code adoption is a state and local issue. Right. Um, and so that creates another uh, level of challenge for kind of widespread uh, enforcement at a particular level. Go ahead. Just one more, I think, important comment. The codes tend to focus on the design features of buildings. So they come in effect when you build a new building or you do a major <clears throat> rehab of a building, but they don't really say speak as much about operation as they do design. And so a lot of the problems that we get actually have to do with things like operation and maintenance as well. Bill, spot on with that. I think we really lack a lot of post-occupancy um, research to find out exactly what the root of the problem is. We can design wonderful buildings on paper and have them, uh, the equipment put in those buildings, but if they're not operated long term that way, uh, they will never realize their true potential, whether it's influencing uh, users within the building or simply just meeting code uh, requirements. Uh, I think post occupancy acknowledgement uh, is something we can do a much better job as, uh, job with in the so how do you do that? You, you raised it, you answer it. Yeah, okay, yeah. fair enough, fair enough. How do you do a post-occupancy evaluation? Or any uh, of you. Uh, yeah, no, they, that's a very good question. And uh, we try to informally do our own post-occupancy evaluations, talking to our clients, how did that work mm -hmm. out, going to visit them, things like that. But that's not, sh that's, that we often don't share that with other people, it's more anecdotal. Uh, but I think there can be a lot more work done. Uh, it, it 
takes money to do it, but to survey buildings, certainly federal buildings, there's been some post occupancy work done in daylighting, and mm -hmm. um, there's been a, some recent work done in uh, circadian influences uh, in build environment. I think more of that will better inform the design professionals and ultimately code professionals as to how we design buildings and how they're used. I find a lot about, I learn a lot about lighting by going back and seeing how something I did previously is still working. In fact, I'm old enough to tell you I'm redesigning projects I designed 30 years ago. Oh, who did that? Oh, we did that. Okay. But that we learn by doing, and we also learn by examining how our buildings are used on a day-to-day -day basis. And certainly from a lighting perspective, that's true. And it certainly is, I think, as Bill brought up in operations, uh, uh, it's, you're only as good as uh, once you've leave, uh, shut the door and go on to your next project as, uh, as the operations team is on site. So a, a, a couple things you know, relative to that. So, um, you know, as far as the, the ongoing operations of buildings uh, and codes, um, there are certainly some criteria, primarily around life safety, uh, that require ongoing enforcement. Um, but some of the areas, uh, you know, like energy efficiency, uh, indoor environmental quality, uh, the code itself doesn't necessarily have kind of those ongoing requirements. Um, you often look to, you know, other, uh, you know, departments within the city to handle that. So whether that's the health department um, or, you know, if there's an energy or a housing department or something like that. Um, there are a couple um, opportunities, uh, you know, within the code process uh, itself, uh, you know, to start to capture, uh, you know, those ongoing aspects. Um, you know, so Randy mentioned, you know, organizations like GSA who have you know, design, construction, and operations expertise. And so being able to, you know, provide input to the code process of you know, what has worked within GSA facilities uh, for instance, would, would be a great opportunity. One thing um, that we also have uh, within the um, 2015 International Green Construction Code is actually a pathway for uh, energy efficiency based on outcomes. Uh, so instead of just design-based criteria, uh, actually showing that you've met uh, some energy targets. Uh, and so that's kind of the, the leading edge of thinking about how to uh, you know, capture the entire life cycle of a building uh, within the codes process. Sort of elaborate, and I think, you know, increasingly there's opportunities to monitor how buildings perform over time and label buildings um, or have that information available, and I think that, that can be helpful. Not everything is easily monitored and labeled, but there, there are some opportunities there. Any questions or comments? I didn't mean to dominate the questions. I just had a number. Anybody else? Okay, here, and then we'll go. Yeah. I was just going to follow up Randy for his statement about more utility. I was wondering if I know there is some movement that has been for development of performance-based standards, and I'm kind of where do we stand with that? Maybe with lighting, it might be Um, yeah, so I mean, there, there's certainly an expanded interest in moving towards, you know, more performance-based requirements uh, within codes uh, in a variety of different spaces. Um, you know, earthquake and seismic design is certainly one of them. Um, you know, certainly as, you know, Randy mentioned, um, uh, you know, lighting quality is not a, you know, prescriptive requirement. Um, it would require a performance-based uh, requirement. So there's certainly discussions, you know, around those sorts of things. Um, you know, uh, thinking about an outcome-based process is, you know, more performance-driven. Uh, um, ICC does have a uh, performance code, uh, which is centered around uh, performance, you know, based opportunities where you kind of set what the desired outcome is and that's what you design towards. Uh, it does take a little bit more kind of verification uh, and enforcement uh, and, you know, the engagement of, of professionals uh, to actually, you know, assure that you're achieving those performance requirements. Um, but I think also as we continue to move forward with uh, computing capacity and artificial intelligence and all of these sorts of things, we can think about more uh, 
performance focused requirements and being able to uh, enforce to those uh, rather than you know prescriptive requirements uh, themselves well I think performance uh, including performance criteria in codes ultimately would be a wonderful leap forward uh, I once had a client say to me if well uh, we were discussing different ways to light their new corporate headquarters says, Randy if you could assure me a 1% improvement in productivity uh, we can pay for this lighting before the projects over uh, we we really can move the needle with improved environments, whether it's light, sound, air. Uh, performance is what it's about. Now, the performance might be working in a factory where you don't want to lose a finger. It might be working in an office where you don't want to make a mistake with a spreadsheet or on your computer. You don't want reflected glare for you to miss something. It might be, and it'll be something different in a hospital and and in a school and so forth. Uh, but there are better and better, uh, uh, it's a better understanding of what those performance metrics by, might be. And eventually, I think some of those can be employed in post occupancy evaluations and then ultimately maybe make their way back to Ryan, um, not you personally, Ryan, but uh, to look at ways they could be brought into the code process, even if it's just referencing these as sort of performance techniques if you want to go over and above the limit or the, uh, the the minimum qualification in the code. I never wanted to have a surgeon who had just the minimum qualifications. And I'm not sure I want to work in an environment who just meets the minimums. And I know that's true. It's the design professionals, the engineers will help elevate that in general to your question. But I think ultimately it would be nice to be able to inform the process a bit on the front end. Just to add, however, to the complexity here and that <clears throat> When, you, when you're talking about human outcomes like performance or health, there are many factors that affect those, those outcomes. And the, the built environment condition is, is just one of many, and, and one of maybe the factors has a small effect. You know, the, the training of the people, you know, their home situations, you know, whether they like their boss, you know, um, the tools that people have. So it's very hard to you know, except through research to isolate the effects of the environment on the performance or the health of the people. And that makes it challenging to use those kinds of metrics in an ongoing way, you know, in, in mass and buildings. So how do we make it less daunting for all of us who are ordinary consumers and inhabitants of buildings and, and then also the whole role of daylighting in terms of thinking about our buildings? Yeah, so as, as far as the, the, the public itself, um, we've actually compiled all of that information into the code itself. Um, so you know, it's more about making sure that the, the code documents uh, are up to date within your community rather than you know each individual consumer knowing that you know I need a ventilation rate of X within you know my community you it's already captured uh, you know within the code uh, itself uh, as a minimum level of requirements now certainly opportunities um, you know to go above and beyond those uh, within your community uh, itself and that's you know where uh, you know professionals from you know organizations uh, you know like IALD and ASHRAE and AIA and others can really help the community to decide you know what is that particular you know above and beyond level um, so you know certainly advocating you know for for the code itself uh, captures you know a whole host of these you know different benefits to speak to your question about daylighting uh, certainly as a lighting design professional I think about daylight on all my projects if possible and how it can be used. Uh, it, there's been a lot of good uh, research and post-occupancy studies that uh, demonstrate, I think, rather convincingly that access to daylight, good daylight, you can have bad quality daylight too. I had to close this when I first came in, you wouldn't have seen any of my slides, right? right. So, I mean, there's a functional attribute there. But uh, uh, access to daylight views out uh, views out of the building uh, can improve that well-being about working in a space or dwelling in a space. So, I, daylighting is something I think most professionals think about. I love. I would like to see more advocates out there talking about daylight. And some states, I must give them credit. California it sometimes can be difficult to practice in California. A lot of codes there that 
are pretty stringent, and but uh, there are there's been some great initiatives regarding daylighting and views and uh, the access to daylight and so forth, even to the point of changing building design so they're narrower and allowing more people access. So I think that's something that's vital, and we should really consider that. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, are there any final comments that any of you wanted to make to leave with our audience? Are there any final questions? But otherwise, I want to give you the final bite at the apple. Definitely, uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to be here. Um, you know, if folks are interested in you know anything relative to codes, resilience, sustainability, certainly um, you know let me know. Be happy to to, to talk with you and and uh, happy Building Safety Month. Well, <laughs> there you go. And don't forget about the reception, right? Exactly. So, uh, Randy. Oh. Okay, sure. great. Uh, well, uh, thanks again for the opportunity, just talking about these things. It's kind of interesting for colleagues to get together in this sort of setting to talk about things they don't know what they're going, their other colleagues are going to say. And we all deal with each other's disciplines, and uh, these kinds of discussions, I think, are very helpful in general. Um, but from my perspective, somewhat selfish as a lighting design professional and and certainly the International Association of Lighting Designers who asked me here, I think just uh, consider lighting outside the, the numbers, so to speak, and uh, it influences our lives. It's not about just the quality of the light, it's really about the quality of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think everything you all have been talking about really gets to the health, the quality of our lives, and how we all function and what it represents, whether it's kids in preschool up through, you know, all of us in terms of our workaday lives and, and our homes and everything. So I, there is so much here and I think so much more information that needs to get out on an ongoing basis. And it sounds like a lot more kind of education, a lot more technical assistance to communities through, I know, I hear from state energy offices a lot about how important code compliance is and making sure that people have resources to get trained in code compliance uh, to make sure that that happens and everything. Because I think all of this stuff, listening to you all, to me, it's like all of this is much more important than what we ever, ever think that it possibly could be. Uh, because all of these things are so interconnected. So thank you all very, very much. Help me help thank the panel. Thank you.